Section 10 of the End of the Middle Age, 1273 to 1453 by Eleanor Constance Lodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 Rise of the Swiss Republic, Part 2. Such success was almost unprecedented at that time, and it is no wonder that stories and traditions have gathered round this birth of Swiss liberty there were certain to be recollections of Habsburg oppression, of cruel bailiffs, and of peasant heroism. The slow striving for liberty has been converted in the stories into a sudden rising and one heroic effort, and these stories have centred round the deed of William Tell, a deed which can be found repeated in the folklore of many northern countries, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, and even England, where the ballad of William of Cloudsley recounts an almost similar event. It was more than a century and a half after Morgarten that the Tell legend first appeared in a collection of documents known as the White Book, and the later chronicler copied it with the addition of such exact details, dates, and names that it was long looked on as an accepted fact. The story runs that Gesler, the bailiff of Albert of Austria, and a monster of wickedness, set his hat on a pole at Uri, that all passers-by might do reverence to it. Tell, who refused, was brought before him and ordered as a punishment to shoot an apple from the head of his own child. This he did successfully, but Gesler insisted on knowing why he had placed a second arrow in his quiver, and promised him his life if he would answer tell replied that if he had shot his child he would have slain with the second arrow the bailiff himself despite his promise gesler bound tell and took him over the lake of lucerne to leave him in a place where as he said he should never see sun or moon again but the rock is still shown as the tells plata whence the prisoner leaped out and made his escape Later, he revenged himself by shooting Gesler in the Hola Gasse at Küsnacht, and became the founder of the Federation. There are other legends connected with the resistance of the Swiss, which have rather more foundation in fact. The secret conspiracy of Stalfacher, Fürst, Zufrauen, and Melstall, their meetings at the Rütli, the storming of the castle of Zarnen, and many others although probably much embroidered and placed by the chroniclers at too late a date, are not wholly impossible and concern people who really existed. It is the story of Tell, however, which has most fired the popular imagination and has been so long bound up with the growth of Swiss independence that he is likely to retain his place as national hero, despite the cold light of historical criticism. After the Battle of Morgarten, the Confederation gained new members one by one. Lucerne was the first to join in 1330, the Allies agreeing to make no new arrangements without the consent of the whole body. Various attempts were made to break this connection, and within Lucerne itself a conspiracy arose to crush out the patriotic party. There is a story of a boy who unwittingly became acquainted with the plot, and was only given his life on condition that he told no man what he had heard who revealed it without breaking his promise in the butcher's guild house he found various patriots assembled and going in he sat by the stove and began to talk to it oh stove stove may i speak the men laughed at him and thought him mad but he went on with his tale oh stove stove i must make my complaint to thee since i may speak to no man Tonight there are men gathered under the great vault at the corner who are going to commit murder. The alarm was thus given, the conspirators were seized, and the patriotic party was successfully established. Zurich was the next to join the League, but she was not at first a very certain ally, and was inclined to play too much for her own hand. She was one of the imperial cities, free therefore from control of count or bailiff, and with the management of her own government, which was, however, distinctly oligarchical. The old burghers, as they were called, the upper classes, excluding artisans and laborers, alone had political rights in the early fourteenth century, and a council, 
entirely recruited from their ranks awarded all places and obtained all powers considerable discontent was caused by the despotism of this ruling body and the more democratic party found a leader in rudolf brun himself an aristocrat but a man of great ambition who was ready to win himself a name at the head of a popular movement brun was recognized as burgomaster guilds were instituted into which all classes were admitted and rich and poor were alike given political votes the constitution was however far from being democratic for the burgomaster was almost a dictator but the revolution raised opponents to the town among the partisans of austria to whom the old burgher party turned for help and in self-defence zurich joined the league of uri schwitz unterwalden and lucerne in thirteen fifty one there were fatal defects in this new alliance for thanks no doubt to brun the different parties reserved to themselves the right of making independent alliances and also the four original members pledged themselves to support the existing government of zurich if need should arise the danger of such stipulations was seen in thirteen fifty four when zurich was besieged by the emperor charles the fourth and brun saved the situation by hoisting the imperial flag and declaring that the town had always been loyal to the empire eventually he went so far as to make a treaty of alliance with austria herself it was not till after brun's death in thirteen sixty that zurich was really loyal to the confederation and could be reckoned as heart and soul with the party of independence in thirteen fifty two glarus and zug formed the sixth and seventh members of the league and in thirteen fifty three the adhesion of bern completed the famous confederation of the eight old cantons bern had been recognized as an imperial city by rudolf in twelve seventy four elected her own officers had her own mint and market and had been granted various privileges such as exemption from any military service which would involve inability to return home the following night but though privileged her government was on the whole aristocratic and military bern had already joined the forest states in thirteen twenty three and won a victory with them but the definite alliance was not made till thirteen fifty three after which time she formed a strong and much needed bulwark on the west now it was that the true war of liberation began the mountaineers were born soldiers and success developed in them a still more warlike spirit in thirteen seventy five their victories over a mixed body of french and english mercenaries led by the lord of coucy helped to increase their self-confidence and ardour for battle the invaders were called englishmen by the peasants or gugler from the cowls kugelhutte which many of them wore a hillock at butterholz where they were repulsed is still called the englishman's hill the chief work of the confederates however was still against the house of habsburg and it was during this struggle that they advanced so much in unity and national policy in thirteen eighty six leopold of habsburg collected a large army of nobles and mercenaries from germany italy and france with which he felt confident of crushing once and for all the insolent peasants his plan was to march upon lucerne as the centre of the confederation and in the hot summer month of july his main force rode round the shore of the little lake of zempach situated in undulating country about ten miles to the north of lucerne here followed the battle which completed the work begun at morgarten and gave real security to swiss independence the battle of zempach thirteen eighty six a band of confederates concealed in a forest awaited the enemy and leopold fell into the ambush with the result that he faced his foes on an uneven plateau quite unsuited for cavalry fighting the austrians dismounted and prepared to fight on foot armed with the long spears they were accustomed to wield on horseback the swiss formed in their wedge-shaped column and armed with halberds and short weapons were wholly unable at first to make any impression on the enemy 
as they could not reach them to strike a single blow the nobles seemed sure of victory when the tide of battle was turned as by a miracle arnold van winkelried so the story runs rushed upon the serried rank of spears seized all he could reach and turned them into his own body formed a gap through which his fellows could enter once at close quarters they were able to do deadly execution with their shorter weapons in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter the knights were nowhere they could scarcely move their long lances they were almost cooked with the hot sun streaming on their heavy armour and were totally unable to cope with the quick movements of the active and light-armed mountaineers in vain leopold enraged at the ill success of his army plunged with reckless courage into the thickest of the fight his fall was the signal for a general retreat in desperate confusion knights and squires turned to fly but overweighted as they were and unable to reach their horses few escaped the confederates fell on their knees to thank god for a victory as complete as has ever been won by any army the news of which spread like wildfire over europe and all men marvelled at the defeat of such a force of chivalry the struggle was not yet over there was a truce for the time followed by another victory for the peasants at Naples, 1388 where the men of glarus imitating the tactics of morgarten flung down stones on the advancing horsemen and then routed them with a charge down the steep hillside every year a pilgrimage is made to Naples and to the eleven stones which are said to mark the place where eleven times the austrians rallied in a vain attempt to stem the victorious onslaught peace followed in thirteen eighty nine by which the duke of austria gave up all his feudal claims over lucerne glarus and Zug. in thirteen ninety three the confederates bound themselves once more together by what was known as the convention of zempach and the Habsburg dukes despairing at last of the destruction of the league signed a peace which was renewed in fourteen twelve and which was the practical recognition of the swiss republic the confederation thus formed was of a very peculiar character and by no means very definitely organized indeed it seems extraordinary that it should have held together at all considering the great differences which existed between the various states and considering also that even their territory did not form one continuous whole uri schwitz unterwalden and glarus the four forest cantons were rural communities of the purest and most typical kind the government was in the hands of the sovereign people who met in open-air assemblies to arrange all matters of importance and on smaller affairs delegated their powers to an elective council in the cities on the contrary the chief authority was exercised by the magistrates zurich was becoming more and more democratic the burgomasters of whom there were two being elected every half year but bern was distinctly aristocratic with a council of twelve chosen exclusively from the upper classes lucerne and zuc were something between the two not only were the elements of the confederation thus diverse but there was no real central organization to keep them together no regular diet existed for the whole although representatives from some of the states may have met occasionally for common business the leagues which united them were very varied and did not always comprise all the eight members of the confederacy the chief bond of union was common hostility to the austrian Habsburgs and common connection with the forest states the heart and soul of the federation the documents known as the priest's charter and the convention of zempach were regulations binding upon the whole body the former chiefly to secure the national character of the clergy the latter a military constitution containing rules as to discipline and management of future wars that such a confederation should have proved enduring that it should have acquired such great military power in the succeeding period reflects the greatest credit upon its members and upon their growing sense of nationality and patriotism End of 
section ten section eleven of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter six schisms in the papacy and the empire part one before the close of the fourteenth century both papacy and empire were reaching a period of the utmost humiliation the old order was already giving way and the coming change was heralded by anarchy and confusion which affected the whole of europe in thirteen seventy eight as has been already seen the death of pope gregory was followed by a double election to the papacy which led to a forty years struggle from thirteen seventy eight to fourteen seventeen between rival candidates for the coveted post a struggle in which political motives had more weight than spiritual considerations in which the personal character of the popes fell perhaps lower than ever before and which could not fail to shake the whole organization of the church to its very foundation the death of the emperor charles the fourth which took place in the same year did not lead immediately to the schism in the empire his son wenzel was accepted for the time as his successor thirteen seventy eight to fourteen hundred but he was a man totally unfitted to fill so distinguished a post above all at such a period of difficulty so great was the imperial degradation under his feeble rule that in fourteen hundred the electors endeavoured to depose him and put rupert count palatine in his place empire as well as papacy was thus in the hands of rival candidates fourteen hundred to fourteen ten a strong emperor might have had some hope of settling church dissensions as it was the papal schism could not be healed from that quarter and other political events helped to prolong the difficulty the schism was indeed in many respects a political question the reluctance of france to lose the influence she had so long exerted over the papacy at avignon and the desire of the italians to have once more a pope of their own nationality established at rome soon gave the dispute between rival popes almost the appearance of a struggle between france and italy certainly the attitude taken up by the different powers of europe toward the question was decided in every case by political motives another important factor in the business was the disputed succession in naples where the house of durazzo and the house of anjou were competing for the throne joanna of naples it will be remembered lost her life while resisting the claims of her niece's husband charles of durazzo and she bequeathed her crown and her quarrel to louis of anjou from the first the rival popes took up the rival parties urban the sixth that of charles clement the seventh that of louis the deaths of these two candidates only changed the persons of the rivals it did not end the struggle ladislas succeeded charles as king of naples and exercised a very important influence not always of a friendly character over the popes at rome the claims of louis the second of anjou were still upheld by the anti-popes at avignon these points are important to remember in working out the history of the papal schism there were besides other and more complicated questions involved and the ambition of the rival candidates was not the only obstacle to the healing of this terrible quarrel in the church perhaps had urban the sixth been of a more conciliatory disposition the difficulty might have been averted when however the cardinals found what an extremely unsatisfactory choice they had made it was easy to urge that the election was invalid because done under compulsion at the time of the conclave when urban was chosen a howling mob without had not ceased to cry aloud for an italian pope a roman pope and they had even broken into the palace itself so that the cardinals with difficulty escaped with their lives had the claim of compulsion been made at once 
it might have been recognized as valid the mistake arose from the fact that urban was accepted without difficulty until his own actions rendered him obnoxious not till then did the cardinals make their new choice of clement the seventh neither of the rival popes had the qualities which would seem desirable for the high position to which they had been raised they were very different to each other in character but alike in their firm determination to maintain their rights urban the sixth thirteen seventy eight to thirteen eighty nine was a man of extreme pride violence and obstinacy he preached poverty to his rich ecclesiastics and commanded that one dish alone should be allowed at their table worse than that he did not attempt to curb his temper and one cardinal was called a fool another was told to hold his tongue he had talked long enough his policy was chiefly to uphold his cause against all opponents and to exalt his own family he seems to have had no other aims nor any clear conception of how to support the papal dignity anti-pope clement the seventh thirteen seventy eight to thirteen ninety four was only thirty-six years of age tall and commanding in appearance far more agreeable and conciliatory in manners than his low-born rival but a warrior rather than a churchman as papal legate in north italy he had headed bands of mercenary soldiers and was stained by the responsibility of a pitiless massacre at cesena when war broke out between the two claimants clement driven from naples by a mob rising took refuge in avignon where a court was once more established the palace there became the recognized home of the anti-pope and a scene of great luxury and magnificence it was this which gave france such a particular interest in the question and so strong a desire to oppose the popes at rome europe fell into two camps urban was supported by italy with the exception of naples by germany and bohemia in return for his recognition of king wenzel as emperor by england because he was hostile to france and by hungary whose king had claims on naples and hoped for help france was backed up by scotland always ready to take the opposite side to england and at first they and naples stood alone as supporters of clement the seventh later castile aragon and navarre were won over for political reasons the schism was a matter which concerned the whole of europe and therefore the whole of europe had to be satisfied before any permanent conclusion could be arrived at when one pope died instead of leaving his rival in possession the different powers concerned felt that they must uphold the justice of their cause by at once filling his place the popes also appointed fresh cardinals and those cardinals could not exist if the man to whom they owed their creation had no right to his office if their position was genuine the other cardinals had no existence and whatever election they made was of no value this was felt equally by the cardinals at avignon and the cardinals at rome in the same way a pope once elected was never ready to admit the worthlessness of his own election if he were to resign leaving the field vacant for his rival and this rival were not really the divinely appointed pope a deadly sin had been committed against the holy office thus political and ecclesiastical reasons combined to render the settlement of the question one of almost hopeless difficulty the death of a pope at rome or at avignon was at once followed by a new election and the longer the schism lasted the more complicated did its solution become meanwhile the character and ambition of the popes added to the troubles of europe urban the sixth soon lost the friendship of charles of naples because he wanted to form a southern principality for his own very worthless nephew butilo when king charles was murdered in hungary in thirteen eighty six urban declared that his kingdom had lapsed to the holy see and refused to recognize either charles's son ladislas or louis of anjou the rival candidate crowned by clement the seventh such struggles added to quarrels with his own cardinals occupied most of the time of the italian pope 
who at last ended his stormy days at rome fighting against the magistracy of the city which he deemed too strong the italian cardinals now chose boniface the ninth thirteen eighty nine to fourteen o four a man of only thirty-three not a scholar nor a student but of good private character and considerable ability he hastened to pacify one enemy by recognizing ladislas as king of naples thirteen ninety and he conciliated the nobles in his own estates his ruling passion was avarice he had without doubt great need for money but his ways of obtaining it were neither dignified nor honourable and rendered him very unpopular he sold everything places privileges permission to break all sorts of rules he seized goods of dying bishops he discussed financial matters even during the celebration of mass in his last illness some one inquired of his health if i had more money i should be well enough was the reply these events were not calculated to raise the credit of the church throughout europe in england the government was endeavouring to check papal power by the statutes of provisors and praemunire whilst wycliffe and his followers were led to question the whole theory of papal primacy and to preach that christ alone should be head of the church even in france the schism was awakening much disgust and the university of paris was busy considering plans for ending so disgraceful a controversy it was suggested that either both popes should abdicate or that the question should be submitted to judges appointed equally by both sides or to a general council of the church it is said to have been partly anger at these proposals which led to the fit of apoplexy in which clement the seventh perished thirteen ninety four bishop creighton writes of him he was not great enough to submit for the good of christendom nor was he small enough to fight solely for himself overcome by the dilemma he died the cardinals at avignon hastily put in his place a learned spaniard peter de luna who took the name of benedict the thirteenth thirteen ninety four to fourteen twenty three they did go so far as to urge that whoever was elected should promise to abdicate at once if called on to do so i would abdicate as easily as i take off my hat said peter and he was chosen once pope however benedict was not so amenable negotiations for his abdication were begun at once commissions were sent to him from the university of paris embassies from royal courts a meeting was held between the emperor wenzel and charles the sixth of france a drunkard and a madman to consult as to plans at last france formally withdrew her allegiance from benedict all was in vain the pope said he would confer with boniface but nothing more tell the king of france that i will pay no heed to his ordinances but will keep my name and papacy till death he exclaimed on one occasion force was attempted when entreaties had failed and benedict was besieged in his palace where despite his capitulation he was kept practically a prisoner for five years meanwhile the roman pope boniface was no readier to resign than was his rival wenzel had promised to secure his abdication but he had no power to fulfil his promise and was soon involved in difficulties of his own with a rival emperor the position of affairs was changed shortly after by the revival of benedict's power disguised as a groom he escaped from avignon and with the help of the duke of orleans regained the obedience of france to his authority he was able to assert his rights more firmly than ever and to disquiet his opponent during the last year of his life the death of boniface was followed by the election of innocent the seventh fourteen o four to fourteen o six who spent the two years of his office in difficulties with roman nobles and ladislas of naples his successor gregory the twelfth fourteen o six to fourteen fifteen was again appointed on condition of striving for unity and he promised to resign whenever his rival should do so the new italian pope seemed in every way fitted to bring peace to the church since no one could expect him to have any great ambition or love of office 
already eighty years of age he was so thin and feeble that the chief fear was lest he should die before the schism was ended he spoke of unity with the greatest eagerness and protested that nothing should stand in his way he would go on foot to meet his rival if horse could not carry him to the conference after some discussion savona near genoa was agreed upon as a meeting-place here both popes were to come and resign their powers that a new head of the church might then be chosen no sooner was this arrangement made than difficulties seemed to arise and gregory's eagerness began to evaporate there was no doubt that since genoa was in the hands of the french king savona was a place which would favour benedict and gregory's friends terrified him with suspicions of false play ladislas of naples also who had great influence over the old man and had many reasons of his own for preferring the schism besides dread lest a new pope chosen at savona should favour the claims of anjou intrigued to prevent the conference and to hinder gregory's departure from rome the two popes came as near to one another as spezia and lucca but there they halted neither one nor the other would advance farther in the words of the chronicler one like a land animal refused to approach the shore the other like a water beast refused to leave the sea meanwhile the discovery that benedict was secretly plotting to seize rome during his rival's absence gave gregory an excuse for repudiating his promise of resignation the meeting at savona was finally given up and in vain did the cardinals summon both popes to appear before a congress at pisa this general council at pisa 1409 was very important as the first of a series of attempts to settle the affairs of christendom by means of a representative body which claimed to be actually superior to the papacy itself solemn sentence was passed on the two competitors who were declared guilty of breaking their oaths and being obstinate approvers of the long schism both were pronounced to be deposed and an obscure friar whose eloquence and learning had raised him to the archbishopric of milan was chosen to be sole pontiff as alexander v naturally the chief result of this measure was to create three rival popes instead of two alexander only survived his election a year never even resided in rome which had to be won for him from the hands of ladislas and died vainly beseeching his cardinals to seek peace and ensue it End of section eleven section twelve of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Schisms in the Papacy and the Empire, Part Two. There was very little doubt as to who would be chosen to succeed Alexander. One very energetic cardinal, Baldassare Cosa, legate of Bologna, had been real ruler of Pope and conclave since the meeting at Pisa he was supported by louis of anjou and had won back rome from ladislas and bought over the orsini family no one dared to oppose him even if they wished it despite his disgraceful private character and the fact that the very good qualities which he possessed were wholly military and secular john the twenty third was enthroned as infallible head of the church fourteen ten to fourteen fifteen after his conquest of rome the new pope summoned a council there to which few went and of which strange tales are told an owl is said to have haunted john on two occasions first it flew at him whilst he was celebrating mass and the next day it appeared again in the church with his great round eyes fixed on the pope and was driven out with difficulty the superstitious felt that the bird was an omen of misfortune or a sign of divine disapproval even john himself was dismayed john had indeed a very insecure position and many dangers the first problem he had to face was the attitude he should adopt toward german affairs and the imperial schism to understand this it is necessary to go back a little 
to see what had been happening in the empire all this time and why succession disputes arose there also germany had been passing through a period of great internal disorder wenzel was a bad king as well as a bad emperor and despite the strong position in which charles the fourth had left the house of luxembourg many difficulties were involved in the management of their extensive and scattered territories wenzel succeeded his father when only eighteen years of age and possessed a very little strength of character he was a sort of spoilt child pleasant in appearance affable and attractive in manner but with no idea of either hard work or self-control in the end his love of eating and drinking which he made no attempt to check undermined health looks and character and changed a promising youth into a feeble and despised drunkard he liked to surround himself with favourites and courtiers both as companions and as assistants in the government and these he chose as a rule from the burgher class or from that of the petty nobility this much angered the real aristocracy and old noble families and helped to render him increasingly unpopular a fact of interest for english readers in wenzel's reign is the marriage of his sister anne with king richard the second which formed a very close connection between england and bohemia this was strengthened by the growing influence of the university of prague and its great attraction to scholars results of world-wide importance arose from this connection for the teaching of wycliffe which gave birth to the lollard sect in england and great influence in bohemia where his writings were first published and where john hus in particular was attracted by his doctrines and became to a certain extent his disciple wenzel succeeded to great territorial possessions the acquirement of which had been one of the chief aims of charles the fourth he had bohemia silesia and lusatia in his hands moravia was subject to him though immediately under the rule of his two cousins jobst and prokop his younger brother sigismund possessed brandenburg and marriage alliances had created possible claims to various other dominions the first territorial question to arise was that of poland and hungary louis the great king of both these countries had only two daughters mary and hedwig and when he died mary who succeeded was betrothed to sigismund younger brother of wenzel the succession was disputed by charles of naples but in the end sigismund did marry the lady and established his rights although for the time being the queen mother elizabeth kept complete control over the government thirteen eighty seven this however only secured hungary for the poles had chosen as their elected monarch the second daughter of louis hedwig who married jogello of lithuania and founded a new dynasty in this separate kingdom jogello was baptized before his marriage taking the name of ladislas v thirteen eighty six this robbed the teutonic knights of much of their legitimate occupation since nominally they were fighting in the north against the heathen lithuanians and now their foes were under a christian king wenzel personally was more affected by a war between towns and nobles thirteen eighty seven to thirteen eighty nine which he was totally unable to control and which brought in consequence great discredit on his authority a discredit which tended to weaken his office as well as himself for some time towns and townsmen had been growing in importance they had acquired privileges and trading rights which had increased their wealth and independence whilst the burghers were individually free and collectively strong through their guilds sometimes larger associations were formed with surrounding villages which were admitted to a sort of modified citizenship the chief enemy of the towns was the class of knights and smaller tenants who liked to amuse themselves with pillage and private war such a form of entertainment was naturally extremely bad for trade and not looked on with approval by the burgesses who united to put down the practice princes and great nobles on their side were ready to support the rights of their order and the materials for a really serious quarrel were thus at hand according to the golden bull of charles the fourth cities might not form leagues except 
for public interests no one however paid much heed to paper prohibitions and an important league was formed of the schwabian cities to check aggressions on the part of territorial magnates such a union was encouraged by the successes which swiss peasants were winning over the Habsburgs, and in thirteen eighty seven a town war actually broke out in schwabia directed particularly against the count of Württemberg, a very determined foe of the burghers in a war of sieges the townsmen knew how to get the better of their opponents but they were not fitted for pitched battles in the open at Dürfingen they were severely though not disgracefully defeated and their courage was much diminished wenzel had a chance of interfering in this quarrel with effect he might have put a price on his interference and dictated satisfactory terms this he neglected to do and the peace of eger which ended the war put further arbitration in the hands of commissioners from schwabia franconia bavaria and the rhine who thus did the work which the emperor shirked the league of towns was followed by a league of nobles this time against wenzel himself and his unpopular favourites and amongst his most determined opponents was his cousin jobst of moravia this jobst has been called by a contemporary writer the most learned prince of his time but probably the competition for such a title was not very high in any case the moravian margrave loved money even better than books and never bought his literature but only borrowed it one thing jobst did buy however and that was part of brandenburg from wenzel's brother the poverty-stricken Siegesmund, but he chiefly used this possession to gain more money by reletting portions of it and he allowed every sort of disorder and highway robbery to continue unchecked now at the head of the bohemian nobles he made himself extremely inconvenient to wenzel who was taken prisoner in his own country and only freed by the exertions and the money of his brother john of gerlitz his only whole-hearted supporter possibly most of the stories which have been circulated about wenzel in order to explain his unpopularity are quite untrue but they show that no shred of respect hung round his memory according to these legends he used to run about the streets of prague beating poor men and destroying statues and works of art while one of his favourite amusements was to watch the executioner at work and to superintend in person the infliction of cruel punishments such as putting a cook who had prepared a bad dish on the spit what shall i write good of this wenzel asks one chronicler nothing he was less the king of the bohemians and romans than their executioner detested by clergy and people by burghers and peasants he was only beloved by the jews the deposition of wenzel however was not a personal matter but the result of the great disorder of christendom and his utter incapacity to take any strong line he did nothing to heal the schism and was fast letting the empire fall to pieces the electors wrote in thirteen ninety seven the empire is no longer ruled by a strong hand so that war prevails all over the country and no one knows from whom to demand his rights on the west the dukes of burgundy were becoming more and more independent and were gradually increasing the territory under their sway in italy imperial influence was totally abandoned wenzel himself had recognized galeas visconti as duke of milan and this able tyrant was fast building up a large and independent duchy in the north whilst the submission of genoa to the french king meant a great extension of french influence in the peninsula it was france again which seemed to be taking the lead in the efforts to end the papal schism in fourteen hundred the electors endeavoured to put a stop to the humiliation of germany and the empire by the deposition of wenzel and the election of rupert count palatine the new emperor if so he can be called was a man of considerable force of character full of activity and ambition but totally unable to carry out his aims a strong heart strong head but short of means as carlyle says for ten years he struggled to maintain his authority and he made vain attempts to reassert imperial authority in italy and to curb the overgrown power of the milanese visconti his death in fourteen ten 
left the empire if possible more feeble and more divided than ever whilst he had ruined himself in the effort and had to sell his own goods to pay his personal debts in fourteen ten the electors unable to agree chose as rivals to the position which wenzel had never formally relinquished his brother sigismund and his cousin jobst thus the empire like the papacy was the prey of three rival claimants this however proved to be the end of jobst who died three months later having added considerably to the general confusion with little permanent result he was thought a great man wrote one chronicler but there was nothing great about him but the beard sigismund fourteen ten to fourteen thirty eight was now really emperor he easily came to an agreement with wenzel who was fond of his brother and also fond of repose according to this arrangement sigismund was only to take the title of king of the romans as long as wenzel was alive but this practically amounted to a complete abdication by the latter of all authority the elder brother remained in prague as king of bohemia until his death in fourteen nineteen he never obtained the imperial crown of rome and he left all his power in the hands of his active-minded junior sigismund was no nonentity whatever else he may have been he was a mass of conceit and restless energy and he interfered in everything though seldom with success he ran ceaselessly from end to end of his dominions and also to foreign lands and wherever he went he carried with him a great idea of his own importance on one famous occasion he made a latin speech in which a mistake in gender occurred one of his cardinals ventured to correct him i am king of the romans and above grammar was the haughty reply an answer which has won for him the title of sigismund super grammaticam in the pages of carlyle the first undertaking of importance to which the new king turned his attention was the healing of the schism john the twenty third had been very anxious to turn the dissensions in the empire to his own advantage and to win help if possible against ladislas who remained obstinately hostile with this end in view he sided with sigismund at the time of the disputed election and germany recognized him as her spiritual head but sigismund once victorious determined to make something out of this alliance and the pope was forced to seal the compact by promising to submit his claims to the judgment of another general council this he did trusting in his own astuteness to save his power all depended on the place selected for the meeting but in a spirit of bravado john left his legates to arrange this with sigismund the monarch induced them to consent to constance as being healthy central roomy and convenient doubtless he did not add that it was an imperial city completely under his control where neither john nor his rivals could hope to gain any influence the pope must have bitterly repented his promise when in fourteen fourteen the death of ladislas of naples freed him from his greatest danger and enabled him to win back rome to his allegiance but it was too late to turn back and in october he set out for the place of meeting through meran he went and over the snowy pass of the alberg whence he looked down on constance a trap for fox as he called it with a prophetic fear of what was before him the long schism was to be ended at last end of section twelve section thirteen of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter seven french history thirteen twenty eight to thirteen eighty part one in thirteen twenty eight as we have already seen philip the sixth came to the throne and prospects seemed bright the new king was chivalrous and magnificent he established a noble court at vincennes held the tournaments and fetes so dear to that age 
and collected round him rulers and knights from many foreign lands he was extremely pious gave costly gifts to religious objects went in person on pilgrimages and in his home life was a good husband and an affectionate father it remained to be seen whether he would be a good king before turning to more interesting matters there is one territorial change to notice which was made on philip's accession navarre which had come by marriage to philip the fair was once more separated from france and bestowed on louis the tenth's daughter joan whose son charles the bad of navarre was to play an important part in coming events some fear was felt as to the attitude edward the third might take up in regard to his own claim to the french throne but none too securely established himself at this date he consented though with some reluctance and delay to do homage to philip as his suzerain for the french possessions possibly if there had been no other reason for war than edward's nearness to the throne matters might have gone no farther but added to the natural antagonism between french and english inevitable so long as england clung to her lands beyond the sea and to the personal jealousy between two rival sovereigns there were other causes at work slowly but surely leading in the direction of war as before scotland and flanders are important in this connection edward the third very early in his reign became involved in a fresh scotch war in support of the claims of edward balliol against david bruce the scots in favour of bruce and independence applied for help to france and philip glad of the opportunity sent troops to their assistance this was bad enough the fact that the french king was turning more than longing eyes upon the guienne territory was worse but fear for english trade was worst of all england in those days was particularly celebrated for her breed of sheep of which the wool was good and long and much sought after for making into cloth hence the great importance of our connection with flanders the country above all others where weaving was most actively carried on the flemings wove our wool and we bought their cloth to the mutual satisfaction of both parties philip was extremely jealous of the trade of england and ready to hamper it in every way he was also much interested in flemish affairs the internal condition of flanders in this reign was rather different from what it had been during that of philip the fourth of france the count louis de nevers was not on good terms with his subjects and he turned for help against them to his suzerain the king of france one of philip's first acts had been to defeat the flemings in a bloody battle at cassel and to reinstate the count who was all the more bound to carry out the behests of his feudal lord thus when philip wished to embarrass england he had a weapon ready to his hand and in thirteen thirty six he obliged his vassal louis to order the imprisonment of all english merchants in flanders edward retorted by forbidding the export of wool and the import of cloth a blow which must have been crushing to the prosperity of flanders the result of the measure was the rising of the towns and the traders against their ruler and their independent alliance with england in the town of ghent a leader was found in the person of a rich weaver jacob van artevelde a man of great personal influence eloquent and determined on his advice a policy of neutrality was adopted and a commercial treaty was arranged by which english wool was once more obtained for flemish looms after war between england and france had actually been declared it is said to have been artevelde who urged edward to proclaim himself king of the latter country the flemings were bound by solemn oaths to alliance with the french king but their oaths did not give his name and they were ready enough to obey king edward rather than king philip in order therefore to gain their active support the fleurs de lys were quartered with the english leopards and the first year of our reign in france was added to the date of all english state documents published in thirteen thirty seven 
there was cause enough without doubt for the outbreak of war and the pretext stood ready to hand in edward's claim one of those who urged him most strongly to the undertaking was a banished frenchman robert of artois who had taken refuge in england after condemnation by the court of peers the county of artois was claimed by robert who disputed the title of his aunt matilda the actual possessor a trial began in thirteen twenty eight but matilda and her daughter died shortly after under such very suspicious circumstances that robert was accused of having poisoned them add to this that he was found to have forged documents to support his claim and to have used magic arts against the king and his family and it is not surprising that he was condemned to banishment nor that when in banishment he was ready to stir up any enemies against the king who had passed sentence upon him a quaint ballad tells how at a great banquet robert offered to king edward a dish on which lay a heron the most cowardly of birds he said for the most cowardly of monarchs when edward showed indignation at the taunt he was asked how he could let a usurper enjoy his rights and heeded with enthusiasm he and all his companions vowed to depart forthwith to assert the english claims many young nobles covering one eye and vowing not to open it again until they had done some deed of prowess on french soil this story is doubtless a fiction but nevertheless a good illustration of the light way in which war was undertaken in those days when it was almost more necessary to find an excuse for peace than an excuse for fighting and when a campaign in an enemy's country was very like a tournament on a larger and more dangerous scale edward however did not go to war unprepared he began to form alliances and to seek for useful support the emperor lewis of bavaria recognized his claims and made him imperial vicar an empty title enough although lewis gave no actual help his support was nevertheless important since it enabled several vassals of the empire to take up edward's cause such were the dukes of brabant and Hilders, the margrave of juliers and the count of hainaut father of his wife besides the flemings of whom we have already spoken philip on his side had the count of flanders king john of bohemia father of the future emperor and several of the princes from the pyrenees the actual declaration of war was in thirteen thirty seven and some fighting took place on the northeast frontier of france but philip avoided a pitched battle and the first striking event in the struggle took place on the sea off the port of chaluche in thirteen forty edward set sail to join his ally the count of hainaut but the french had suspected his movements and as he approached chaluche he saw so many vessels that their masts were like a wood at which he greatly marvelled these were a fleet chiefly composed of norman ships which had already done damage on the english coast and captured one of our boats the christopher then began a battle fierce and hard on both sides archers and crossbowmen shooting against one another and men-at-arms fighting hand to hand boldly and bitterly and that they might better reach one another they had great iron crooks attached to chains which they threw into the enemy's ships and fastened them together so that they might better board them and fight more hotly the day ended in a victory for the english and the recovery of the christopher after which a truce put an end to the fighting for the time being by the victory thirteen forty england gained a control over sea and shipping which was most useful in the coming struggle in the following year events occurred in france which tended greatly to benefit the english and encourage edward to recommence the conflict the duchy of brittany was still a very independent feudal state almost wholly removed from royal influence duke john the third who had been fighting as an ally of philip died in thirteen forty one leaving no children and a succession question arose curiously like that in france itself john's next brother had died leaving a daughter joan of pontievre the nearest to the succession by right of birth and she had married charles of blois a nephew of the french king 
a younger brother of the late duke however john of montfort had seized the duchy and was supported by the greater number of the bretons themselves a struggle began between these rival claimants backed up by france and england in direct opposition to their own claims edward supported montfort philip took up the cause of charles of blois then began a long and confusing struggle of more than twenty years duration which constantly hampered the french king and was full of romantic incidents the chief combatants themselves were striking characters charles of blois a true medieval saint was made up of opposing qualities he treated his foes with cold-blooded cruelty but he heard mass four or five times a day wore pebbles in his shoes and knotted ropes round his body and once indeed when he had captured a town and his soldiers were needlessly slaying the inhabitants he first returned thanks to the cathedral and then stopped the massacre john of montfort himself played no very leading part he was taken prisoner in the first year of the war and died in the fourth his wife joan of flanders who had the courage of a man and the heart of a lion continued the struggle when her husband was taken she brought her little son before her supporters at rennes and claimed their aid do not lament she said for the lord you have lost behold my little child who will be his avenger if god so will i have wherewithal to fight and you shall choose a captain who will be your comforter from town to town she went raising the spirits of the garrisons and finally held out in enbon which was besieged by charles of blois here she herself led a surprise party which burnt the enemy's tents and it was her determination which prevented surrender until an english reinforcement came to her help like sister anne she watched from a window for the promised succour until the moment of submission had almost come but at last she was able to cry here comes the help for which i have been longing and when walter manny and the english arrived she kissed him and his companions one after the other two or three times and those who saw her might well say twas a valiant dame it would take too long to follow Foissart through the detailed account of skirmishes and sieges which went to make up the breton war but it can be easily seen how a disturbance like that was a godsend to the english king who wanted nothing more than a good entry into france through the land of brittany in thirteen forty four actual war was renewed between england and france with the sending of the count of derby into guienne but before edward himself took active part in the struggle he suffered a great loss in the death of his ally jacob van artevelde thirteen forty five various causes led to his murder probably the leader had made himself too powerful while struggles were arising between different trades the fullers and the weavers being especially jealous of one another the final impulse may have been given by news of artevelde's conference with edward when it was proposed to bestow flanders on the young prince of wales in any case a riot rose in ghent jacob was besieged in his house and despite his eloquent appeal to the people was killed without mercy edward then at schluch sailed away so moved and angered at the death of his friend that it would be marvel to tell and the count was reinstated in power in thirteen forty six edward collected a force for the help of the count of derby in guienne but partly on account of contrary winds partly by the advice of godefroy d'arcourt another discontented frenchman who had joined the english he changed his undertaking into an invasion of the north and landed at la hogue the famous crecy campaign is too well known to need a long account burning and pillaging especially at caen and passing close to paris at poissy where the seine was crossed the english army retreated toward the river somme followed closely by philip who had started after them from his capital every bridge had been destroyed to hinder their passage but by the aid of a peasant a ford at blanchetac was found and crossed 
despite a force of the enemy stationed on the opposite bank to check the advance philip arriving soon after was unable to pass at the same place as it was only possible to do so whilst the tide was low he thus lost some time by having to go round by abbeville so that the english army was strongly posted at crecy before it was overtaken by the french in the battle twenty sixth of august thirteen forty six which followed the evils of the old military system were glaringly displayed to meet the compact and disciplined force of the english well supplied with archers and foot soldiers france had a turbulent feudal levy each leader thinking himself above authority and supreme over his own soldiers whilst the genoese crossbowmen mercenaries despised by the french nobles were in no way a match for the english with their long bow every detail of the day seemed to be to the disadvantage of the french a storm of rain rendered the crossbows of the genoese unprotected apparently from the weather almost useless when the sun came out with renewed brightness after the storm it shone full in the face of the frenchmen the two marshals quarrelled before ever the battle began and the first charge was a moment of wild confusion the luckless mercenaries sent to open the fray were shot down by english archers in front and trampled on in the rear by the french cavalry which was pushing forward from behind nevertheless the french fought bravely if not wisely and edward's chaplain writing after the fight says modestly the battle was hard and lasted long for the enemy bore themselves most nobly but praise be to god they were discomforted and the king our adversary was put to flight it was almost evening when the fighting began and midnight before it was over so that edward camped on the field all night philip forced from the battle fled in the darkness to the castle of bois which opened its gates on recognizing his cry open open chatelain tis the unfortunate king of france many of the highest rank perished on the field amongst others the count of flanders the duke of lorraine and the blind king of bohemia who was led by four knights that he might strike one blow in his friend's cause and who was found dead still attached to his leaders edward as is well known had left the burden and the honour of the day to his young son the black prince that the boy might win his spurs he kissed him after the battle with words of praise fair son god give you good perseverance you are my son indeed for loyally have you acquitted yourself this day well do you deserve to hold this land from crecy the english marched upon calais and for eleven months the city bore the horrors of a siege september thirteen forty six to august thirteen forty seven edward built for himself a regular town outside the walls villeneuve la hardie he called it where he was joined by his wife and where the english settled themselves comfortably down with houses and shops determined to starve out the place rather than storm it by assault this they very effectually did blocking it by sea and land and though philip came within sight of the walls he did nothing to help the brave defenders the loss of calais meant much to france and as a safeguard for the channel and the passage of their ships its possession was a great source of strength to the english once more a truce ended for a time the wearisome struggle shortly after these events philip the sixth died but he was succeeded by a son of very similar character john the good thirteen fifty to sixty four like john of bohemia owed his title rather to the fact that he was open-handed and courteous and loved feasts and tourneys than to being in any sense a good king though like his father he was no general he was brave chivalrous and a great admirer of all knightly deeds his order of the Etoile, intended as an imitation of king arthur's round table and with most elaborate rules as to dress and ceremonies expressed well the character of its founder when the struggle was once more renewed success again favoured the english at this juncture charles of navarre becomes prominent a grandson of louis x of france 
he possessed besides his own kingdom of navarre scattered estates throughout france especially between paris and normandy which rendered his friendship of great value john realized this when he gave him his little eight-year-old daughter in marriage but there was no making sure of the slippery king who earned the title of the bad even in those days of respect for rulers he played fast and loose with both sides encouraging the english to renew the contest deserting them when they did as he advised forcing king john to endless humiliations to win him over and then proving the most uncertain of allies at the date of the black prince's famous campaign of poitiers he was for the time being a supporter of france having been forgiven by the king for his murder of the french constable which had threatened to create a permanent breach between them the chief seat of war was now the southwest the nobles of gascony were on the whole favourable to the cause of the english their country was very distinct from the rest of france and they had been long accustomed to the rule of their distant suzerain in england whom they found less interfering than one nearer at hand at the present moment too they were suffering from a high-handed procedure on the part of jean d'armagnac a great baron of the south in the service of king john they therefore wished the prince of wales to come to their help and received him with many expressions of loyalty after a devastating campaign in the south thirteen fifty five to thirteen fifty six in which many towns and much booty fell into his hands the black prince turned northwards with the intention of joining forces with the duke of lancaster but he was met by john at the head of a very large army confident of cutting to pieces the small english force prince edward chose his ground well not far from the town of poitiers and there awaited attack he was stationed on a plateau sloping down to a marshy valley guarded from the french by a hedge along which the archers were planted and which had one gap in it led up to by a road with the exception of a small force for skirmishing the soldiers were on foot in order to make the most of the rough ground and their defensive position but with horses at hand to use if a charge was wanted on saturday seventeenth september thirteen fifty six the prince took up his station sunday was spent in fruitless negotiations conducted by the cardinal of perigord an emissary of the pope who had long been endeavouring to end the useless bloodshed in vain however the churchmen rode from one army to the other suggesting terms the prince refused to treat he had no power he said to make peace without the consent of the king his father and the cardinal although he renewed the attempt next morning could no longer command attention edward was busy encouraging his soldiers if we are small in numbers compared to the enemy let us not fear for that for victory does not lie with the multitude but where god shall give it if we win the day the more glory to us if we die there are those who will avenge us on monday nineteenth of september the battle of poitiers was fought it was a surprisingly easy victory the french mistakes were very similar to those of crecy arising chiefly from rashness and lack of discipline but there was also a want of firmness among the nobles which caused them to lose the reputation for bravery which had been considered their one redeeming feature the two french marshals in their cavalry rode first to the attack but were thrown into dire confusion as they advanced up the road to the gap by the arrows showered upon them by the archers along the hedge and they threw into disorder and panic the troop which was advancing behind them advance sire advised the prince's friend sir john chandos the day is yours charge on the division of your adversary the king of france for there is the heart of the business forward john was the reply you will never see me retreat the three eldest sons of the french king and their division fled before the onslaught in the thick of the battle john himself with his youngest son philip who never left his side held out till all was lost surrendering in the end to a knight of artois had a quarter of his men resembled him the day would have been for them says foissart not considering that something more than courage goes to the winning of a battle 
the treatment of the captured monarch illustrates well the best side of the chivalry of the time john was brought to the tent where the prince was resting after his exertions the latter welcomed him with all honour he bowed low and received him as king well and wisely as he well knew how to do and commanded wine and spices to be brought which he himself gave to the king in sign of great love that evening edward gave a banquet to the chief of his prisoners at which he served the king with his own hands and begged him not to let his defeat spoil his appetite for you have great reason to rejoice although the affair has not ended to your wishes for to-day you have won for yourself a name of renown and have surpassed all the brave warriors of your party as usual the victory did not lead to any great results a truce followed and next year john was conducted to honourable captivity in england where he hunted and feasted and enjoyed life with the best his one return to france was after the treaty of bretigny when he went back to arrange the details of the peace and to collect his own ransom failing in which he returned to his easy imprisonment and died in the tower of london End of section 13section 14 of the end of the middle age 1273 to 1453 by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter 7 french history 1328 to 1380 part 2 this peace which ended the first stage of the war was negotiated in 1360 when edward had made a fresh invasion this time in the north of france his campaign was not very successful the french knew better than to risk another pitched battle and the english failed to enter into reims or paris finally on the receipt of very bad news from scotland telling of fresh incursions and an alliance with the dauphin the english king made up his mind to treat the conference as to terms was held at the little hamlet of bretigny near chartres and the treaty was confirmed and formally signed at calais the terms although edward gave up his claims to the throne were of great material benefit to the english and show that the crown was a pretext rather than the motive of the war in return for this renunciation edward was to hold in full sovereignty without homage or allegiance of any sort guienne poitou and the surrounding states of the southwest and in the north ponthieu guine and calais with its environs france was no longer to help the scotch nor england the flemings the other clauses related to the conditions of king john's release which as we have already seen were never carried out shortly after this the black prince established his court in bordeaux the centre of his independent government as prince of aquitaine a pause in the war furnishes an opportunity for considering the actual condition of the country during the struggle knightly deeds of arms sound romantic and picturesque in the pages of foissart but there was a reverse side to the picture and a very black one as the war dragged on the king fell deeper and deeper into financial difficulties and the mistakes already made by philip the fair were repeated with additions dues on sales continued a gabelle on salt in which the king had a monopoly and which all were forced to buy in large quantities was introduced and the coinage was depreciated to an unheard-of extent meanwhile the burden fell almost wholly on the poorer classes endless exemptions being sold or given to the rich and noble at the close of philip the sixth reign pestilence came with all its horrors to augment the misery of the country the black death wrought fearful havoc here as throughout all europe some estimate the deaths at one half the population in paris when the plague was at its worst eight hundred people perished in one day even royal oppression and deadly sickness were not the worst evils of the unhappy country the armies on both sides were largely recruited from mercenary soldiers of different countries whose only livelihood was war and when a truce for a time put an end to the struggle 
these brigands as they were called were let loose on society with no means of supporting themselves but pillage and extortion the poor people fled before them as from a prairie fire women and children sought refuge in caves and underground hiding-places afraid to trust themselves to the light of day always a scourge they were organized into regular bands or grand compagnie after the battle of poitiers and began a career of systematic plundering establishing themselves in some feudal stronghold they not only ate up all the surrounding country but amused their idle moments by persecuting torturing and robbing the wretched peasants whom they despised as rustic clods anything they thought could be done with impunity to jacques bonhomme these soldiers of fortune were often high-born warriors and the french nobles themselves cared little for the humble tiller of the soil except in so far as he was their own property and a part of the livestock on their estates such a condition of things could not be endured for ever and there was a murmuring and stirring throughout the country which might have warned the selfish feudal baronage that the people had rights which would one day be asserted the towns were the first to begin the struggle against privilege and oppression it was a time when trade was beginning to be more considered when guild associations were formed to carry it on and the example of the flemings and van artevelde may also have had some influence on the burgesses of france it was paris alone however which was able to take any leading part the french capital being always considerably in advance of the rest of the country the real leader of paris was the provost of the merchants who from a simple director of the trade upon the seine had become the chief official of the town and head of all the burgesses in thirteen fifty five this office was filled by etienne marcel a man respected by all and chosen on several occasions as leader of the tiers -etat as the representatives of the towns were called in the states-general both philip the sixth and john had recourse to the states-general in the hope of getting more money by their help the spirit of growing independence is shown in the words addressed to the king by the towns as early as thirteen forty seven most powerful sire you must know by what means you have conducted your wars in which you have lost all and gained nothing despite their efforts however they were unable to introduce improvements in the system of taxation the nobles were too strong and equality was unattainable when the capture of king john had put the government in the hands of his eldest son charles a boy of eighteen an opportunity seemed to present itself and on march third thirteen fifty seven a sort of charter of liberties was drawn up chiefly through the agency of marcel which was the first real attempt to check the royal power and to give the people a voice in government according to this document a commission of thirty-six twelve chosen by each estate was to superintend every branch of the administration the states-general were to meet several times in the year and to be consulted on all matters of importance a good coinage was to be established and never altered again without consent of the states the nobles were to be restricted in their privileges and no private wars were to be allowed the french historian michelet says of this great ordinance that it was more than a reform it was a change of government and that though it was a change for the better such a step was dangerous in the face of a foreign foe the prince or dauphin footnote, dauphine was an old imperial fief sold to france in thirteen forty nine from which time it was always bestowed on the eldest son of a reigning king who thus acquired the title of dauphin as he was called signed the document but it was obvious that he did so under compulsion and king john sent from england to annul all that the states-general had achieved up till now nothing but praise can be given to etienne marcel he had taken the lead against real abuses he had raised the spirit of the parisians and fortified the town in case of foreign attack he had drawn up a scheme of reform democratic but not violent he now becomes involved in a policy less possible to defend once started on a career of reform 
it is very easy to be driven into revolution his first mistake was to join hands with the king of navarre his second was to make use of the jacquerie we have already alluded to the misery suffered by the peasantry at the hands of the nobles and the brigands no wonder that they rose in revolt at last and no wonder that in that revolt they imitated only too closely the evil deeds of their own oppressors the final impulse was given by an order to repair the feudal strongholds a work which fell to the lot of the serfs who saw in these castles the worst engine of their oppression and who rose in fury the peasant was still half civilized and brutalized by ill treatment and his revenge for past oppressions was appalling like a herd of wild beasts the jacques poured over the north of france burning ravaging killing no man woman or child was safe from their blind thirst for blood it is possible that etienne helped to stir up this rising although it is certain that he disapproved strongly of its excesses so did the leader of the peasants himself william Kahl, who tried in vain to organize a moderate revolt to obtain remedies not vengeance whether responsible or no for the outbreak etienne encouraged an attack made by the jacques on meaux where the dauphin's wife and many other noble ladies had taken refuge in strong fortifications known as the market the terror of the besieged was great any fate they felt would be better than to fall into the hands of the enraged peasantry but they were saved by the opportune arrival of a gascon force returning from prussia who fell upon the vilain little black and badly armed and saved the situation marcel gained little through these allies who were put down with a severity which equalled their own excesses thousands suffered death little trouble was taken to distinguish between innocent and guilty the cry of the nobles was death to the vilain and etienne writes that cruelties were committed worse than ever were done by vandals or saracens the peasants had spoilt a good cause by ignorant violence and the result was more oppression and worse treatment even than before meanwhile within paris itself things were going badly marcel had made himself head of a regular party distinguished by the wearing of red and blue caps one day followed by a host of supporters he penetrated into the louvre to overawe the dauphin whom he found in the company of the two marshals of france clermont and conflans etienne addressed the dauphin and blamed him for not restoring order in the kingdom i would do it willingly replied the youth boldly enough had i the wherewithal bitter words ensued and the followers of the provost roused to fury slew the two marshals so close to the prince's side that his robe was splashed with the blood of the murdered men marcel made him wear the red and blue cap to save his life and actually dared to demand his approval what has been done he declared was to avoid still greater peril and was by the will of the people the dauphin could do nothing at the moment but marcel had not strengthened his own cause and he imprudently allowed charles to leave paris and so form a rallying point for all enemies of the burghers the defeat of the jacquerie led to the fall of the provost the nobles after crushing the peasants remained in arms and rallied round the regent who was thus provided with an army for the siege of his own capital etienne meanwhile went a step farther in the wrong direction by calling the great companies to his help he had enemies within the city now as well as without and the king of navarre was a very doubtful ally he had brought a mercenary army for defence of paris but was secretly negotiating with the dauphin and finally withdrew with his troops to st denis in these straits the provost as a last hope planned to open the gates of paris to charles the bad and to proclaim him king of france he was found at midnight with the keys of the city by maillard one of his own magistrates and in past days a trusty friend etienne etienne what are you doing at this hour he asked i am here to guard the city of which i have the government by god was the reply you are here for no good at this hour and pointing to the keys which betrayed his purpose maillard slew him as a traitor with his own hands whilst his followers overpowered those of the provost 
31st of July, 1358. So perished a man whom it is very hard to judge. His early career was full of promise, but he seems to have become narrower and more selfish in his aims as time went on, until he, who had striven to give a real constitutional government to France, died in a treacherous endeavour to maintain his own ascendancy. But it is easier to condemn than to act under circumstances of so much difficulty. Etienne Marcel failed in what he had attempted, and there was no one else who ever attempted it. In 1364, the death of King John put his son, the regent, on the throne as Charles V, a very different man from his father or grandfather. Pale and thin, delicate from a childish illness, which had also left his right hand swollen and weak, so that he could not hold a lance, he was not the popular ideal of a king in those warlike days, yet he won for himself a position which neither of his predecessors had held. His surname of the Wise partly came from his love of books and learning, partly from his cautious and cunning character, and it is true that he ruled his country with a wisdom that had excellent results. He did nothing to strengthen the popular element in the government. The States General only met once during his reign, but if his rule was despotic, it was capable and orderly, and it gave to his subjects a feeling of security which meant more to them than democratic control. Only on its financial side can bad mistakes be found in his policy, and even here he won popularity by checking the debasement of the coinage which had done so much harm. In the struggle with the English, he introduced the plan of avoiding battles, and so leaving the enemy to all the dangers of a hostile country, with no great successes to compensate and to raise their spirits. In the war, the king was ably assisted by one of the greatest soldiers of the age, who introduced into the French army some of the discipline and subordination which had been so lacking in the earlier campaigns. Bertrand du Guesclin came of a good Breton stock, though his was a younger branch of the family, and in rather humble circumstances. As a child he was so ugly, so rough, and so intractable, that though the eldest son he was disliked by his parents. His mother used to make him sit at a table by himself that she might not be annoyed by his odd face and awkward manners, and the younger brothers were served before him on one occasion when bertrand was only six years old he was so furious at this treatment that he upset the whole table and behaved like a mad thing but a nun who was in the house soothed the boy and prophesied great things for his future after which he was treated with a little more consideration many tales are told of his youth as a boy he would drill the village children and conduct hand-to-hand -hand battles when he was seventeen he took part secretly in a tournament dressed in borrowed armor and unhorsed all the knights who rode against him except his own father with whom he refused to fight in the end his visor was raised and he was recognized to the intense surprise and pride of the father who had shown him scant consideration hitherto but who now equipped him with arms suited to his position and let him take part in knightly exercises Bertrand's earliest military experience was in the Breton War, where by his great personal strength and courage, and by the skill with which he conducted skirmishes and sieges, he earned a reputation which won him knighthood, and brought him before the notice of the highest in the land, whilst he gained the love of the people by his constant resistance to the evil deeds of the brigands. With the reign of Charles V, peace was temporarily established, and the long Breton struggle was brought to an end. At the Battle of Auray, 1364, Sir John Chandos, probably the ablest of all the English captains, was victorious over Du Guesclin, who was taken prisoner. Charles of Blois himself was slain on the field, and the aspect of affairs thus altered. As a result, John de Montfort, son of the lion-hearted Joan, was recognized as duke, and for a time the country was at rest. Cessation of war, however, only meant added misery to France, as long as the ravages of the free companies continued, and it was partly to provide some occupation for these professional soldiers 
that the French king took part in a Spanish dispute. On the throne of Castile sat Pedro the Cruel, a man so hated by all that his half-brother Henry of Trastamare found ready support when he disputed his title. Pedro, amongst other ill deeds, was reputed to have murdered his wife, a sister-in-law of Charles V, and this gave Henry an excuse for claiming his help. Bertrand, at the head of a large body of mercenaries, was sent to fight for him, whilst Pedro won over the black prince, who made the great mistake of his life in consenting to assist the man whom he looked upon as rightful monarch. Prince Edward and Chandos, at the head of a large force of Gascon and English, were successful at the Battle of Najara, or Navaretta, captured du Guesclin, and restored Pedro, 1367. Nevertheless, it was an ill day for them. As they lingered in Spain to await the promised payment for their services, which never came, the whole army was wasted with disease, and their leader brought back with him across the Pyrenees a shattered constitution and an empty purse. The former was past cure. The latter he tried to refill by a heavy hearth tax on his principality of Aquitaine. Money he must have, if he were to fulfill the promises made to his soldiers, promises which Pedro had entirely repudiated, but the expedient was fatal. The Gascons were poor and proud, the nobles were not accustomed to be taxed, and the result was an appeal to Charles V for help in this emergency. Pretexts were always at hand for a renewal of the war, 1368. Both sides could point to unfulfilled terms in the Treaty of Bretigny, and a phase of the struggle began in which every advantage turned to the side of France. Bertrand was ransomed and made constable, the highest military rank in the country. Chandos was killed in a skirmish. The black prince, soured by ill health, lost his last chance of popularity in the south by the ghastly massacre of the inhabitants at the siege of Limoges, and went home to die. Henry of Trastamare, who with his own hands had killed Don Pedro in a quarrel, was now king of Castile, and aided the French with a fleet which blocked the coast of Aquitaine. In every respect the English were inferior to their enemy, and the end of Edward's reign saw his possessions reduced to a little territory round Bordeaux and Bayonne, and the town of Calais. Charles V, completed his successes by the final humiliation of charles of navarre who having spent his life in playing fast and loose with both sides ended by having no friends at all and crushed between france and castile died ruined and impoverished despoiled of all his rich territories in france the french king was nearing his own end he was not to die however without one failure in thirteen seventy nine he tried to unite Brittany to his own demesne, with the result that he roused against himself a united and successful opposition which reinstated John of Montfort more strongly than ever. The death of his great constable also was a loss not easily made good. Bertrand died while besieging the brigands at Chateauneuf, and the keys were given into his hands as he lay on his deathbed. No place did he besiege which did not surrender to him, living or dead, writes an admiring chronicler. In a very few weeks he was followed to the grave by Charles V, 1380, young still in years but worn out by disease. The country was left in a very different condition from that in which he found it, but though he had done much, the seeds of future troubles were still left, in those three small pieces of English territory. End of section 14.